the joy of a raindrop and its sorrow in a swamp, the beautiful words of the Iranian poet Ismail Khoi from his poem reflecting on the Iranian revolution, the joy of a raindrop and its sorrow in a swamp. In 1979, the joyous and pure aspiration of a nation for a secular revolution, for justice, for freedom, for independence, fell into an Islamic swamp. And for millions of Iranians, the sorrow continues to this day. The women of Iran were amongst the first group to experience the shock of a new Islamic regime. The hijab became compulsory, and women were forced to wear it. I remember 8th of March, 1979, the day before the newspapers had announced that women had to wear the hijab to work the following day. The following day, women didn't go to work. They went on a strike, and 100,000 of them poured into the streets of Tehran, marching from Tehran University and shouting strong slogans like, Man inqilab nakardam, ke ba'aqab bargardam. I haven't revolted to go backwards. Estiqlal, azadi, huquq ejtemai, independence, freedom, civil rights. Zir shikanje migam, ya marg, ya azadi. I say it under torture, either death or freedom. But as strong as the slogans were, they were not enough to stop the new Islamic regime from imposing the hijab law on Iranian women. Interestingly, amongst a sea of uncovered women protesters in 1979, there were many hijabi women, some covered in full chador. That's a cloth that covers the body from head to toe. In a filmed interview with a French journalist, one Chadori woman says that she sooner denounced her faith than to see the rights of women trampled upon by the new hijab law. Another Chadori woman says that she encouraged her daughters to get educated so that they could be free, so that they wouldn't be dictated to. The new hijab law, she said, took her daughter's freedom away. Looking at today's Iranian woman, walking on the same streets as the woman protesters did in 1979, I cannot help but think how counterproductive the hijab law has been. There's been a huge explosion of cosmetic and plastic surgery amongst Iranian women. Many Iranian women, as a backlash to Islamic dress code and morality rules, are embracing a very extreme version of westernized ideas of beauty and sexuality. The hijab law, rather than encouraging women towards piety, has in fact pushed them to adopt a very distorted version of western modernity. This is a very good example of how enforcing unjust rules can be counterproductive by pushing people to the extreme of the opposite side. In fact, the origin of 1979 revolution in Iran itself can be traced back to another imposition on women, this time in the form of forced unveiling of women. In 1936, Reza Khan, the former Shah of Iran's father, in an attempt to push Iran into rapid westernization and reduce the influence of religion in Iran, banned women from wearing head covering in public. Reza Khan's plan was to drag Iranian women into modernity by the lock of their hair. Women who wore head covering in public were arrested, were shot at, and some were killed. The screaming and cursing of women became endemic. 
Some women vowed never to leave their homes again. A new law, which was supposed to bring liberation to women, in fact contributed to a greater suppression by making women prisoners in their own homes. The hatred of forced westernization, the lack of respect for traditional and tribal values, sow the seeds of revolution that came in 1979. Reza Khan proved that tearing away the veil by force not only doesn't lead to liberation, but is likely to pave the path for extremism. This is an important lesson which is lost to some European countries that have already passed specific laws to ban face covering, which is only practiced by a very small minority of women in the West. This type of ban, such as banning the burkinis, which we have seen recently, is only likely to lead to further isolation, marginalization, and extremism amongst Muslims. If European countries are serious about having a cohesive society, then they should look at the discrimination against their Muslim population. They should look at the housing issues. They should look at the high rates of unemployment amongst Muslim youth. This is the best way of combating extremism. Today, what is problematic is not the hijab. It is its imposition on women. Women should be given a choice. 30 years ago, my sister and I were lucky enough to exercise that choice. After we left Iran, as soon as we stepped inside the safety of Heathrow Airport, we took our hijabs off and dumped them in the first bin that we came across. Looking back, what we were throwing away was years of suppression, because the people who had forced the veil on our heads were the same people who wanted to force a veil on our voices, on our laughter, on our courage, on our sexuality, on our thoughts, on our imagination. They wanted to control every aspect of our lives. And the truth is that for many um, Iranian of my generation and my, and my mother's generation, the hijab was never part of our cultural or religious identity. But it's very important to recognize that for many Muslim women around the globe, the hijab is indeed an important and an integral part of the religiosity and spirituality. Contrary to the popular belief, many Muslim women say that they want to wear the hijab not because they want to become invisible, but because they want to become more visible. The hijab, they say, gives more visibility to their consciousness, to their thinking, to their practice, to their behavior, and that is why they wear it. For many Muslim women, the hijab is an internal message to themselves, and more importantly, an external message to the outside world that they are faithful to the principal values of their religion, that they are believers, that they are followers. Hannah Youssef, in her brilliant video for The Guardian, says hijab is not against liberal values, but it's seen as a threat because it resists the commercial imperatives that support a consumerist culture. Hannah says, in a commercialized world where a woman's value is reduced to her sexual allure, wearing the hijab can be quite liberating. But oddly enough, for some women, wearing the hijab is indeed about consumerism because it's become a fashion statement. And that is why that companies like Dior and Dolce Gabbana have turned it into a multi-million dollar fashion industry. But for others, wearing the hijab is a journey towards self-discovery. They may not wear it forever or even all the time, 
But when they do wear it, they retreat into a spiritual sanctuary that brings them strength and security. In a recent visit to London, I came across a hijabi lady um, serving behind an Armani makeup counter in a well-known department store. I asked her, why do you wear the hijab? She told me that she'd been thinking about it for a long time, and she finally decided to wear it after the death of her grandmother. She said putting on her hijab every day reminded her of the values that she cherished the most, love, family, spirituality. No matter what motivates women to wear or not wear the hijab, what is important is that we trust that women have the intelligence and strength to understand and resist their own oppression. I am filled with pride when I read about my fellow Iranian woman, Fatima Baraghani, also known as Tahereh, a poet, an educated and courageous woman, Tahereh, as early as 1848, in an act of defiance against the subservient role of woman, removed her hijab in a gathering of men. She caused such shock and horror that one man reportedly cut his own throat and left the meeting with blood gushing out of his neck. Tahereh's brave fight for women's liberty came before the first ever women's convention in the United States. Whether or not Islam instructs the head covering of women remains a contested issue amongst Islamic scholars. Of course, we need to condemn the compulsory veiling of women wherever it happens, whether in Saudi Arabia or in Iran. But where women do have a choice, we need to respect that they will exercise that choice to their benefit and the benefit of the society at large. If we believe that the choice to cover less doesn't lead to liberty, then why assume that the choice to cover more leads to oppression? In the end, the only veil that needs lifting is the one that covers the mind. Thank you.